The heavy bell of St. Paul's tolled for the death of another day. Midnight had come upon the crowded city. The palace, the night cellar, the jail, the madhouse, the chambers of birth and death, of health and sickness, the rigid face of the corpse and the calm sleep of the child. Midnight was upon them all. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to your new school. I'm so glad you could transfer here. Um, it's great to have you. Yeah, anyway, welcome back to my channel. I don't know what this video is going to be called yet. It's all about Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This isn't a book review by any means. It's not anything like that. It's if I had to kind of sit down and talk to a group of people about this book and what I was looking for and taking notes about going through this whole reading process, what I would want to talk about, what I'm interested in, and what I thought was really amazing um, about this book, and essentially, like, if I had to give a lecture, the topics that I would want to talk about. So that's what this video is kind of going to be about. I'm going to split it into sections of what I'm super interested into talking about because I have a lot of notes. I think I'm going to split this up into about three different big subject areas that I was really intrigued and loved studying when I was reading Oliver Twist. I read this in June and I've really loved the experience of thinking about it um, much more <laughs> than reading it. Oliver Twist was written in 1837. Dickens does so much. Just to give you a brief summary, if you are thinking of reading the book yourself, we follow Oliver. He's this young boy, he's an orphan, and he is working in a workhouse. That's something that right off the bat, I think talking about Oliver Twist, you want to talk about. Because the poor laws in Victorian England um, brought about in the 1830s basically mandated that if you were poor, you could go to a workhouse wherein you would have to work for several hours a day and they would give you food and shelter if um, you basically sold your labor to survive. The government, I suppose, thought this was a very charitable idea, but in reality it led to extremely inhumane conditions. Um, and of course these people are now just being used for these jobs to get done, for this labor to be accomplished. They are selling themselves, working themselves sick, they're getting fed almost nothing. Um, the conditions are awful, and so in Oliver Twist you really see that because the book begins with him working at one of these places, and essentially he escapes. He makes his way to London, but he finds that life there is not much better because he quickly gets inducted into this den of thieves, and he battles with himself in this tormenting, anguishing conflict within himself seeing if he can survive or if he has to turn to a life of crime just in order to eat and live life. Dickens did write this book a lot in response to these poor laws because he saw how awful they were, how they really were hindering more than helping, um, and so right off the bat this book like gives you more truth than a lot of the authors writing at the time about poverty and about criminals, um, especially through a more romanticized lens we're doing. What does Dickens want to do with this novel? He says that he wants to draw a knot of such associates in crime as really did exist to paint them in all their deformity, in all their wretchedness, in all the squalid misery of their lives, to show them as they really are, forever skulking uneasily through the dirtiest paths of life, with the great, black, ghastly gallows closing up their prospect, turn them where they might. It appeared to me that to do this would be to attempt to something which was needed, and which would be a service to society. How does Dickens and Oliver Twist, like how is he a service to society? How is this book doing any good? The first thing that I wanna talk about which really struck me and which was such a giving area of exploration is this starvation and this talk about consumption that takes place in Oliver Twist. There's so much about food, there's so much about, you know, nourishing yourself and people who are unable to do this. Um, of course, the workhouse where you have to go to work in order just to be given a morsel of bread. And there's so much in this book about appetite, whether that's appetite for food, whether it's greed or injustice, whether it's the appetite of those who are in poverty who just want food in order to survive, or whether it's the appetite of those who are in power over the poor and who want money and greed, and that's what they feed on. In Oliver Twist, probably the most famous line if you've read Oliver Twist, but it's of course, please, sir, I want some more. I would like some more. Give me more. I want more sounds like quite a greedy 
proposition or idea, but one that's coming from the mouth of an 11-year-old child who is starving to death when he could easily be given more to eat. It's not about greed anymore. It's about injustice and it's about just wanting to survive and have your basic necessities to live on this planet met. Turning from that as well, it documents kind of this desperation and the violence that drives people to commit crime into a life of crime just so that they can eat some food. This system in Victorian England, Charles Dickens is just so brilliant at showing you how it makes people turn on each other. It separates people into classes and then these classes start to battle each other, whether that's in the streets, whether that's in the court of law, whether that's pickpockets taking from people and it just creates this endless cycle of violence that makes like its inhabitants feed on each other, which is such an interesting topic of exploration in Oliver Twist because there's so much about like that consumption and feeding off of other people where it's like this weird form of cannibalism. Mingled with that are suggestions of actual cannibalism because um, when Oliver Twist is staying with a group of other young boys who need food to grow and live, he says boys have generally excellent appetites. Oliver Twist and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last they got so voracious and wild with hunger that one boy, who was tall for his age and hadn't been used to that sort of thing, hinted darkly to his companions that unless he had another basin of gruel, he was afraid he should some night eat the boy who slept next to him, who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. He had a wild, hungry eye, and they implicitly believed him. So this kind of actual cannibalism, like the prospect of this one young boy eating his bedmate because he's so hungry in this workhouse, um, kind of segues into this material kind of cannibalism in this world of crime where pickpockets and thieves and stuff like that take from other people. Not their flesh, they don't consume their flesh, they don't eat other people literally, but they are taking something that belongs to another party, usually part of their identity that is central to the society at the time, or maybe it's their financial identity if they're stealing their money, maybe it's this materialistic style identity, their fashion, if they're taking their handkerchiefs or stealing their hats or some other part of these people's identity. And more often than not, these belongings that these people are taking, these thieves, um, and Oliver's den of thieves who he gets embroiled with, they're taking attributes of this upper class that the lower class themselves are unable to reach and a lot of the time it is this upper class it's these people in government or even the middle class who perpetuates um these laws who send people to jail if they're in debt who send beggars to jail if they're just trying to get a loaf of bread in the street it's these people who are keeping the poor poor when oliver asks for more just for a little bit more food it's met with such extreme hostility and violence from the workhouse supervisors. Oliver is beaten when he asks for more food for him and his friends. And that's kind of one of the central topics when these people, these low characters, um, these people who we feel either pity or this sense of repugnance for when they ask for more from society or from people who do have that more and the extra to give them, they are met with hostility, they are met with blows, they are met with threats of death and so they can't ever rise above their station and achieve more because even though this surplus and this bounty of whether it's food or home or shelter or money the government could allocate to actually helping these people instead of just shoving them away into workhouses where they remain invisible and perish once more into invisibility, this asking is always met with refusal. There is also so much talk about different kinds of food and what the poor and people like Oliver should be given to eat in order to make them better members of society. When Mr. Bumble is asking why Oliver is misbehaving or why these children are misbehaving, he asks their caretaker what they're eating and what she's feeding them. And she says that she's been feeding them meat. And so Mr. Bumble, instead of saying that, oh, these boys have gone mad, it's not madness. It's just that you've given them meat. You've overfed him. You raised an artificial soul and spirit in him, unbecoming a person of his condition. What have paupers to do with soul or spirit either? It's quite enough that we let them have live bodies. If you had kept the boy on gruel, this would never have happened. So there's even this idea that Oliver and people like him shouldn't be given to eat what other people can afford to eat, like meat. But in this case, Oliver hasn't even had some like delectable meal, some like high class meal. He's been given the dirty odds and ends, which nobody else would eat. And so they blame this transgression, this like being mad or acting out or something like that on eating too much. 
um, as if like trying to exist and trying to take up space for these people is a sin. And not only a sin, but we see a lot of this consumption and a lot of this appetite and a lot of these people just wanting to eat food and being linked with death because one of the first images in Oliver Twist that we get of consumption is from an undertaker who Oliver gets apprenticed to. The undertaker is sharing his snuff box with the beetle. He thrust his thumb and forefinger into the proffered snuff box of the undertaker, which was an ingenious little model of a patent coffin. So you have this thing that you're consuming wrapped up in this object in the symbol of death. Even more scarily and probably more accurately, Dickens describes one of the um, overseers and caretakers of the children at the workhouse, whether they're sick or whatever, they go to her to be taken care of. She is described and given the name the farmer of infants. Another thing kind of in this whole area of consumption and appetite is the way that um, what they eat kind of describes who they are and also this leading towards and tending towards animalistic descriptions when Dickens describing um, different people and the poor and Oliver and other people like him working in the workhouse. There are so many scenes where they are depicted as animals and they're just reduced to these animalistic descriptions, which is also indicative of kind of this fodder that these people are being turned into. They're hidden away, they're kind of kept in cages, which are these workhouses where they provide labor and fuel for the society to keep, to keep on turning, whether that's washing people's clothes or doing any assortment and variety of work that the rich can either profit off of or ignore the government thinks that they don't actually have to do anything, have to do actively anything to help these people. They can just shut them in these charitable houses. And then it leaves other working men kind of in the middle class or a little bit better off than them to try and profit off of these workhouses or profit off of death as we see the undertaker doing. And that leaves the poor themselves in these situations with a few options. They can get thrown in jail if they're in debt or try to beg in the streets. They can go to these workhouses and see if they can survive the conditions where most people perish, or they can turn to a life of crime, which most of the time also results in them getting thrown in jail and meeting their death in the gallows. So it's kind of like this self-fulfilling prophecy wherein the government and the society in Victorian England has created this system where poor people can find no way out of the system via any avenue, and more often than not, um, it brings about their death in all the three ways mentioned. And back to this idea of kind of this animal that Dickens is depicting them as. Dickens says, if you had looked at Oliver Twist, you would have seen him clutching at the dainty meats which the dog had neglected and witnessed the horrible avidity with which he tore the bits asunder with all the ferocity of famine. There's so many other passages where they're described either as dogs or as less than dogs or as rats where Oliver sees other people like him, but he's so afraid to look at either women or men that he's passing by because they seem so like the rats he had seen outside. So if you do turn to a life of crime, which we see Oliver battling with this whole time as he's getting inducted into this den of thieves, what do you feed on? Like what is your focus of consumption as a criminal? It is on those who put you in this position or on those who you see as better than your position and who have things that are valuable for you that you can sell. I think this type of consumption can also be read more deeply um, in a moral way as well because if a pickpocket is stealing something like an embroidered handkerchief with someone's initials on it or someone's pocketbook, they're stealing more than just material things at that point. You're participating in identity theft. Things like ID cards or like I said money and name sewn clothing and this fuel money that the middle and upper class have used to solidify and create their identity in the world. It can also be read I think at a spiritual level and like I said a moral level wherein not only is it a sin you're committing a crime, you can be seen to be stealing the soul of these people because that's what they prize most is their wealth um, and their fashion and their upper class things. And you can also see the more wealthy people of the period getting implicated in the system wherein they stand to lose a lot as well, lose their identity when their belongings are going missing, their belongings are getting stolen, they have to watch themselves every time they go out on the street and protect their economy that they've created. Congratulations, you've made it to the intermission of our lecture. I thought I would make use of some footage that I never ended up using in this project, but that I feel really bad about because I got my brother Benjamin to be Oliver for me. Anyway, these speak for himself. Please applaud his dedication. Okay, now slump and die. Go.
all of her rides. <laughs> Furtively. What? Furtively. English? Um, like you're trying to hide something. <laughs> what am I hiding? The fact that you're running away. <laughs> you're on the verge of death. <laughs> ben, that branch is Ben. No, 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 Ben! To be fair, that one's on him, it's not on me. I told him not to climb that tree. It's time to talk about death. All right, moving away from consumption and appetites and everything that we were talking about towards what happens when people can't satisfy their need to consume either food or basic sustenance and nourishment that human beings need, death. Oliver Twist is a book that absolutely just crawls with sickly imagery. It contains so many different people that Dickens just shows you for a second. They like appear in the reader's car headlights and then they vanish, never to be seen again, kind of like deer on the side of the road. But for that one split second, you get such an intimate view into their lives. And often it is a view that produces so much pity and a desire to do something in the reader, hopefully, which is what Dickens wanted when he wrote this book. Oliver Twist is also a novel that is mostly set during the night. It's mostly set during hours when it's dark out, the sunlight is gone, and so it's this really dark book, literally. But as well, it's a book that's split between two worlds because when Oliver is in London with the Den of Thieves and when he's witnessing all of this horrible neglect that is happening in large parts of society, it is almost always dark, it's almost always raining and cold and gloomy. He describes the trees outside as the hands of ghosts, but when he is whisked away into the countryside, all of a sudden it is this like fantasy dream world of light and flowers and spring and gardening. So it's kind of split between this world of sunshine, but also this world of just nightmarish visions in the dark. Death is also an extremely prevalent character in Oliver Twist. It haunts almost every single page. It is always hanging over almost every single character that Dickens depicts from people in the workhouse to the cold, wet, shelterless London streets that Dickens writes so beautifully. And even to beautiful girls like the character of Rose in Oliver Twist who occupies that sunshine world they too have to fight with things like consumption. Oliver Twist's life himself, just to talk about the young boy for a second, the progression and journey of his life in this book very much resembles that of a funeral procession. He goes from the workhouse and from there he's taken away to be apprenticed to a coffin maker and immediately finds himself sleeping among coffins, which I think is Dickens' subtle way of letting you know how many children leave the workhouse in that they don't really leave. So he finds himself sleeping among coffins and from there Oliver kind of death-like at this point descends into the London underworld of crime but he's just gathering these layers and pasting on these layers of invisibility um, to the public and to the government who prefer to ignore those without a home or shelter. When Oliver's apprentice to Mr. Sowerberry, the undertaker, um, he gets a view of an unfinished coffin on black trestles, which stood in the middle of the shop, looked so gloomy and death-like that a cold tremble came over him every time his eyes wandered in the direction of the dismal object, from which he almost expected to see some frightful form slowly rear its head to drive him mad with terror. The recess beneath the counter in which his flock mattress was thrust looked like a grave. A lot of the times as well, Dickens depicts death for characters who have no home, no job, and are slowly suffering in a multitude of different ways. Dickens depicts death for them as a mercy um, and is the only way to end this extreme form of suffering. The first time we get Oliver realizing that is when he wishes, as he crept into his narrow bed, that that were his coffin and that he could be laid in a calm and lasting sleep in the churchyard ground with the tall grass waving gently above his head and the sound of the old deep bell 
to soothe him in his sleep. That same mercy that's in Oliver Twist kind of becomes a delight for people like Mr. Sourberry, the Undertaker, to delight in. And through Oliver, the reader gets to see that death um, in this time in Victorian London is often something that's exploited. Innocent people and criminals alike meet grisly, horrifying ends that literally stick with you. Um, it's quite gruesome and gory. Dickens shows us faces of what he thinks is utmost evil, but He's also quite aware, I think, and shows the reader as well the circumstances, the environment, and the institutions that bred these faces of evil. One of my favorite things when talking about death in Oliver Twist as well is different attitudes towards it. So because Dickens shows us like people from every walk of life in almost all of his novels, but when it comes to death, we see so many different attitudes towards it as well, but specifically in Oliver Twist, these attitudes are kind of through the lens of the lower classes and the upper classes, and their views and their perspective on death is really heartbreaking to see that difference and that that shift. We have Mr. Brownlow, who becomes a benefactor for a time to Oliver, and he's quite an old, well-off man of middle to upper class, and he views death as something to be grieved, but also he has the luxury to grieve. He has the luxury to plan funerals and mourn his family and mourn the people he loves. They're passing from a very privileged viewpoint where he is still safe and healthy. So even grief changes um, its face for different types of people and where they're living and how they're living. Mr. Brownlow says that he won't make a coffin of his heart, even though he's lost so many people and could very easily succumb to grief, but he still has enough hope to keep going and says that he won't seal it up forever against love and hope and redemption and all the good things of life. And for people in the same kind of caliber, like Rose, who I was talking about when she has a battle with tuberculosis, it's this very sad, tragic, but also so beautiful death that is oftentimes depicted in women of the Victorian period. It's seen as this beautiful tragedy where you lay in a white nightgown in your bed and surround yourself with flowers and everyone dotes on you and people come and confess their love to you and you become an angel. But for other people that Oliver gets to see when he's apprenticed to the Undertaker, they are literally thrown on the ground and die shivering and starving. As they lay upon the ground, something covered with an old blanket, Oliver shuddered as he cast his eyes toward the place. For though it was covered up, the boy felt that it was a corpse. So for these people in death, they become, they don't get to be angels. They just become nothing. They become objects. Um, for your eyes to glide over and slide away, and there is no hope for them. Nancy, who's part of the Den of Thieves, confesses to us that she has no certain roof but the coffin lid, and no friends in sickness or death but the hospital nurse. You just see like how upsetting this shift in attitudes toward death is, where for people like Nancy and other people in the Den of Thieves, it's the only certainty in their life. It's a hard fact. They know they're going to die at some point, and sometimes they don't so much grieve it as desire it above all else. While for well-off people, it's this like abomination to be grieved and feared, and they have the luxury of grieving and of fearing it. You just get this super intimate glimpse into poverty, and that's kind of the last thing that I want to talk about because in Oliver Twist as well, Dickens finally like polishes off that mirror um, that other authors for such a long time had been reflecting society um, and its lowest classes in. Because in this novel, and Dickens himself says so in the prologue, um, all the romanticization and glamour of criminals is washed away. And Dickens clearly shows the horror that is life for people living in these places, where even the rats in these places are starving and succumbing to famine. We see men and women with folded arms and bodies half doubled, who occasionally skulked like shadows. The kennel was stagnant and filthy. The very rats that here and there lay putrefying in its rottenness were hideous with famine. And a man confesses that's going to have his loved one buried that... I tell you, I won't have her put into the ground. She couldn't rest there. The worms would worry, not eat her. She is so worn away. Yeah. So scenes like that and just that like truth that slaps you in the face, it's not hidden in Oliver Twist. It just like, it is there. Dickens writes it. It's this brave new author at the time because Oliver Twist is Dickens' 
technically his first novel aside from the Pickwick Papers, which were a series of sketches. It's his attempt um, at change and recognition, and this novel actually did a lot when it was published in society. Because Oliver Twist is a story about a young orphan, what I want to focus in on, and what Dickens does as well in Oliver Twist, is focus in on the effects that this kind of life, that poverty, this starvation and essentially this invisibleness that people have put onto these people of lower classes, what this does to its children. Because not only is death this prevalent figure that is always hanging over everyone's heads in this book, but so is aging in general and approaching death, but specifically through the lives of children, which makes it all the more devastating. So Dickens too zooms into that ecosystem of crime and injustice and focuses on the children who often suffer the most in these cases. A dirtier or more wretched place he had never seen. The street was very narrow and muddy, and the air was impregnated with filthy odors. There were a good many small shops, but the only stock in trade appeared to be heaps of children, who even at that time of night were crawling in and out at the doors or screaming from the inside. So many children in Oliver Twist become commodified, they become objects, they become commodities to be bought and sold and abused at will. Not only in these workhouses, but even beyond that when we get into Fagin's Den of Thieves, which is mostly composed of small children who work best at pickpocketing people on the streets. One of the major tragedies that I want to talk about in the plight of children in Oliver Twist and in Victorian society um, at this time in general is that children are wiped of that identity of being a child. Their childhood is stripped, taken away. It is no longer an identifier for them. Not only do they themselves kind of forget and are unable to live their childhood, but a lot of people on the street treat them not only as vermin and less than human, which we kind of already talked about when it comes to consumption and those animalistic descriptions of a lot of children being seen as rats, but they are treated and a lot of times punished by the justice system as adults. So it's just this erasure and this blurring into loss of their identity. It's a phenomenon that Dickens doesn't only examine through the lens of children. We also have a lot of discussion about women and girls losing that identity as well when they slide into a life of crime. In Oliver Twist, young boys and girls are aged like well beyond their years in so many scenes, not only through what they're doing, but their manner of speaking, how they're talking, their way of looking looking at life is one they've been just forced to grow up so quickly and so rapidly and to desert every single mention or memory of childhood. One of the first scenes that Oliver sees of the other young boys in Fagin's Den of Thieves is them seated around this table and they're just talking to each other. But he says, seated around the table were four or five boys, none older than the Dodger, smoking long clay pipes and drinking spirits with all the air of middle-aged men. If they escape from the workhouse like Oliver and if they get to London and bigger cities and they can start to make a living as thieves, they do so at the absence and the certain loss of their identity. This is also illustrated in one of the scenes where Oliver is left alone with Fagin. Oliver wakes up and Fagin is there going through um, his pile of stuff that he's recently stolen or acquired from his younger minions. And it is also the cover of this edition of Oliver Twist 2. It's the image of a clock. So Oliver wakes up and sees Fagin like dangling um, this magnificent gold watch sparkling with diamonds. At least half a dozen more watches were severally drawn forth from the same box and surveyed with equal pleasure. Fagin, in this case, who's seen as the employer of these boys, he's literally holding their lives, he's holding their lifespan, um, and it can also be seen as him taking away or the system that's forced these boys into this life of um, theft, stealing away and taking away their time and aging them so rapidly. Also, one of the saddest scenes that um, I just wanted to close up this section with and the video is that when one of their members, either a child or someone else, gets imprisoned, right, and gets caught from pickpocketing or stealing something, they're thrown into jail and Fagin tries to turn it around and make it this sign of celebration because he's going to be kept in the same cell as gentlemen who have committed crimes, criminals who are gentlemen of the upper class, so that when your crime is finally found out and caught out and you are thrown into jail, that being imprisoned kind of erases all traces of class and economy because 
for once, um, these people are celebrating that they're going to be kept in the same cell as gentlemen. This is kind of their only way to approach being as close as possible in identity to the upper class that they have been cast out from. So that's Oliver Twist. Um, it's a pretty good book. Definitely has its problems, which I do, or no, Carolyn and I do have a live show discussing all of that. And in that live show, I was critiquing Oliver Twist. So if you want to see kind of my problems with it, because like I said, I really enjoyed more of the experience of thinking about this novel and all of those parts that I just talked to you about and that um, I really enjoyed thinking about and studying. If you want to see the critiques, that is in that live show with Carolyn from Carolyn Mary Reads. I would highly recommend um, Dickens. I'd, I say, I'd say if this is your first time reading Dickens, or if you want to get into Dickens, don't start with Oliver Twist, maybe start with something else. Um, but I still think Oliver Twist, it is such an important book, and Dickens did such an important job at really slapping the Victorian public in the face at the time with all of these problems, most of which they worked to create. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, talk, whatever this has been. I'd love to do more of these in the future, so if you have any recommendations, requests, books you want to see talked about, other things you want to see talked about, then, you know, yell it in the comment section. So, thank you so much for watching, um, I hope you enjoyed, and we will speak very soon, I'm sure. So, until then, ciao!